Greetings and Happy New Year to everyone. Welcome to this first Women's Health Awareness Real Talk webinar for 2021. I'm Dr. Joan Packenham, Chair of the Women's Health Awareness Steering Committee and Director for this NIEHS Women's Environmental Health Initiative. So on behalf of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the Women's Health Awareness Steering Committee, and our co-sponsors, the Durham Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and North Carolina Central University, we are extremely honored to have each of you with us this evening and excited to bring you this important program. I want to begin tonight by first announcing that it is Radon Action Month. Action implies that we do something. We not only listen to learn, but we do something. We invite you to listen to our podcast on Radon Awareness by visiting www.niehs.nih.gov backslash women's health awareness. We ask that you complete the radon questionnaire, order your free radon test kit, and that you test your home for the presence of this potentially deadly radioactive gas as radon is the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. It is important that you test your home yearly as your home settles and cracks and crevices can develop without your notice. Radon is a gas and can seep in your home through these new cracks and crevices that you may not be aware of. So please do not delay. Listen to the podcast and order your free radon test kit today as supplies for the free test kits are limited. Tonight's Real Talk webinar is titled, Understanding and Reversing Diabetes, Heart Disease, and Most Chronic Illnesses. The overarching goal of this webinar is to learn if you can make lifestyle changes to prevent and or reverse many chronic diseases. This slide quickly highlights our agenda. The session chair and moderator for this evening will be Ms. Joyce Page. She will provide the objectives of this important information session and introduce our speaker for this evening. I am excited about this important session as I feel that it brings hope that we can prevent, manage, and control chronic disease. The remedy is partly in our own hands and there is a possibility for us to reverse the severe health outcomes of some chronic diseases. I am also excited as Dr. Hatch grew up right here in Durham, North Carolina, and is a graduate of my alma mater, North Carolina Central University. Quickly, a few webinar reminders that we don't want you to forget. This session is being recorded and uploaded to YouTube. American Sign Language and closed captioning services are available throughout this webinar. Evaluations will be sent immediately after this webinar via email. For completing the webinar and evaluation, you will receive educational contact credit hours for your participation. A few webinar housekeeping details. The Zoom Q&A is located at the bottom of your Zoom window when it is full size. Most of the controls are found in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Q&A is used for all comments and questions and closed captioning is provided during this webinar. So this is just an example of how you use your Q&A. Click on the Q&A icon to open it, type your question in the Q&A box, use the thumbs up icon to like a question asked by another person, check the send anonymously box if you want to conceal your name, and then click enter to send. 
I am honored tonight to introduce Ms. Joyce Page, a longtime friend, mentor, church member, and colleague. Joyce is a native of Durham and a graduate of North Carolina Central University and the UNC Chapel Hill Gilling School of Public Health. And she has always been a staunch health advocate for the Durham community and beyond. Joyce is a public health education specialist and coordinator of the Men's Health Council for the Durham County Department of Public Health. Her work in public and community health spans over 30 years. And with her current work, she is dedicated and devoted to improving health among African-American men by working with the Men's Health Coalition. We are truly thankful and very fortunate to have her as part of the Women's Health Awareness Program Committee and chair of this evening's webinar on understanding and reversing diabetes, heart disease, and most chronic illnesses. I introduce you to my friend and colleague, Ms. Joyce Page. That was so nice of you, Joan. I am excited. I cannot tell you how long I've waited for this moment. And I'll start by introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Alan Hatch. Dr. Hatch is gonna talk about understanding and reversing diabetes, heart disease, and most chronic illnesses. Looking at that next slide, you'll see that Dr. Hatch, well, you see from the first slide that he has many, he has many areas of expertise, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this session, in this session, he's going to explain what causes diabetes, heart disease, and many other chronic diseases that plague our society. And he's going to describe life changes, lifestyle changes that we can use to reverse diabetes, heart disease, and most chronic illnesses. Participants at the end should be able to describe what diabetes is and what causes it, what causes heart disease and many other chronic diseases that again, cause us to suffer from sickness and death. Also, you should be able to identify the key components of a healthy diet, a healthy exercise program, a stress management program, and an emotional support program. Looking at the next slide, you'll see a picture of Dr. Alan Hatch, a cardiologist and the owner of the Saline Heart Group in Benton, Arkansas. He's the cardiology director at the Saline Memorial Hospital in Arkansas. But again, he did grow up in Durham, North Carolina, at least part of his life when he wasn't in Boston or Mississippi with his parents. In addition to being a diagnostic cardiovascular specialist, Dr. Hatch has a strong interest in preventive medicine. He's always counseling patients extensively on preventive health care measures and on lifestyle modifications. In 2016, the Saline Heart Group in Arkansas became the first and the only site for the Ornish Reversal Program which Dr. Hatch directs. Now this next slide shows a picture of how Dr. Hatch helped to get where, who helped Dr. Hatch to get where he is? His parents, legendary Dr. John W. Hatch is Professor Emeritus of the Health Behavior and Health Education Program at UNC Gilling School of Public Health. Dr. John Hatch was a member of the Tufts University Medical Schools team that developed the nation's first and the second comprehensive community health center that serves low and modest income individuals. This was back in the 60s and the 70s. Since that time, the nation is full of community health centers, thanks to the work of Dr. Hatch and his teammates. But Dr. Hatch, John Hatch, the father, is just one part of the story that got Dr. Alan Hatch where he is. And that's his 
famous mother, Mrs. Fleger C. Hatch, and the C is for Camille. Ms. Hatch decided in her 90s that she was going to become an athlete. She went on with her daughter's help to win the 2019 National Senior Games in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's also the winner of the 2019 North Carolina State Senior Games. She competed in the 50 meter run for women aged 95 and above. She had planned to do it again in 2020, but because of COVID, it was canceled. You can see the pictures there that cover their faces. So unfortunately you can't see them completely, but the Hatches are sending you a match, message to go out and get that COVID vaccine. They got their vaccine last week and you see the pictures of them. And that picture in the bottom is Fleedra Hatch winning in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So as John has said, the question and answer session will be summarized and included, but you can ask your questions now. We received several already, but you can ask your questions in the Zoom Q and A, which will be used for all the comments and questions. The Zoom Q and A is located at the bottom of your Zoom window and when it's open in full view. You might have to use your mouse to hover over the toolbar to make it show up. Questions and answers will be posted on the Women's Health Awareness website. And it's listed here. Joan mentioned that earlier. And this is the website that you went to also to register for this session. Now, with all of that said, I'm going to introduce you to a fabulous man, Dr. Alan Hatch. And remember, you will have a chance to ask questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Hatch, for coming and doing this. Glad to see you. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's I'm just happy to be home, if not uh, virtually. Uh, <laughs> I'd uh, like to thank you guys for inviting me and uh, just been looking forward to this uh, this evening. Oh, good. And I will leave while you're doing the talking. Well, thank you very much. And again, this is an interesting, uh, interesting talk. Um, in fact, I didn't come up with the title these smart ladies did. And I was like, oh, man, this this is going to be good. Um, understanding and reversing diabetes, heart disease, and most chronic illnesses. And again, the thing that would have jumped in my mind several years ago was, um, ooh, well, it, uh, ah, okay. Um, is, you know, again, most illnesses, you know, that would have surprised me several years ago. And, uh, and over the last several years, I've really come to believe that you know, if not all illnesses, you know, many of the most important ones. And again, that, that list might include uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, but I think we would be surprised that it might include uh, some other things like atrial fibrillation and sleep apnea. Now, again, your diet and how you exercise and, you know, doesn't necessarily affect these things, but indirectly, you know, if you gain weight, um, you end up getting sleep apnea. If you get sleep apnea, uh, it puts stress on the heart and you get atrial fibrillation. So that um, if you kind of take care of things at the top, well, then good things begin to roll downhill. Uh, I thought this was particularly interesting and, uh, and we are really looking forward to the results of this trial. The Ornish uh, folks in California are actually now conducting a trial looking at can we halt or reverse even dementia? Uh, we know it can help diabetes. We know it can help coronary artery disease, even reverse blockages, but can it help dementia? And we're gonna see, because again, we think many of these processes have the same underlying cause. Joint pain, we often think of joint pain. Arthritis says, well, I weigh too much and my joints hurt. I have degenerative arthritis. Um, but maybe it has a metabolic etiology, you know, maybe some of the same things causing 
inflammation in the brain and in the vessels and in the heart or affecting joints as well. So again, are we saying that all these diseases are reversible? Um, we're not saying all of them, but we're saying uh, they are really improvable and, and some may well be uh, reversible. Um, now, why are CMS and the government so interested in this? And it's because we literally are spending billions and billions of dollars. 50% of patients with diabetes eventually develop some type of heart failure. And again, heart failure is a major driver of admissions. 33% um, high risk of diabetics landing in the hospital with heart failure compared to those without diabetics. So without diabetes. Um, so that if you end up in the hospital with heart failure, if you have diabetes, you just have a higher chance and you're often sicker. And, uh, and again, we end up spending more money to take care of those folks. And it's just more difficult. 43% of Medicare dollars are being spent on patients with congestive heart failure. And again, much of this is related to uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes. And again, just 40 billion, you know, over $40 billion a year in heart failure. Diabetics are more than twice as, uh, um, have more than twice the cost of healthcare of other patients. And I suspect it's, it's more than that. 4,000 citizens are diagnosed with diabetes every day. And, and I tell you, we see folks coming in our clinic every day with this diagnosis and a host of other diagnoses it's because these things, they, they tend to run together. Um, orthopedists, urologists, podiatrists, we have all the same patients. You know, when we run into them at say some sessions at the hospital, um, they know us all because they have us all. As a country, we can't afford this. And again, the good thing is, is that the treatment and, and potential for reversal is just so great. So again, looking at this list, hypertension, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, many reversible, many fixable. Um, I think it's interesting to say that prostate cancer is on this list and why? Because cancer loves inflammation and then, and, that, and this is how it um, um, this is how it proliferates and um, and when we can decrease that inflammation we often begin to reverse cancers dr ornish's program actually was shown to reverse prostate cancer in early stages and halt its progression and is an excellent adjunct to medical therapy um, so that yes uh, what we eat and what we do and how we live has a tremendous impact on our uh, health overall. So again, what's going on? Again, bad food, too much food, too much stress, and not moving around enough. I mean, it really is this is this simple. And to this evening, you know, we'll end up discussing just a few of the physiologic principles that that uh, make this true. Now, again, this is uh, the uh, Dr. Ornish, uh, who again, started his program in California at age 23. And again, why a 23 year old would begin to think that there's a unified concept to chronic diseases and that you could reverse heart disease is still beyond me. I listened to his explanation, it still doesn't make sense. Uh, but very smart dude and, and doing just great things for our patients. He has come up with a unified theory. He again, strongly believes as do a lot of the other experts in lifestyle med medicine. Again, I'm a cardiologist, but these are the guys who are the expert and the leaders in the field. And, uh, and they really believe that these problems really have a common source. Um, whether the source is biological uh, or whether it's cultural, um, we really believe that, uh, that our lifestyle programs and other folks' lifestyle programs can end up making a big difference. Um, one thing I wanted to reiterate was actually this statement because he made this statement there and I even asked him a question about this. And, and he said, you know, these pathways and mechanisms are greatly affected by different cultures, diet, exercise, and lifestyle choices. And going on down, he was really talking about um, 
what we do and what we eat and how we live affecting us. And in fact, began to talk about some immigrants who had come to this country and how fast they began to look like us as they live like us. And then they begin to die like us, uh, you know, with the same hypertension and diabetes. Again, we can beat this. Now, these are some of the common factors that are involved um, when diabetes begins to uh, begins to affect us. And um, chronic inflammation, alteration in gene expression, stasis, oxidative stress. Now we really don't have to understand this, but we all know what kind of inflammation is. And um, alteration in gene expression, that simply is genes kind of run the show and you have proteins that can begin to change um, how our cells react. And, um, and some of these proteins, these negative proteins are really increased during periods of stress, with bad diet, with lack of movement. Uh, that's what stasis is, lack of movement, not moving around enough. What we now know is that just 20 or 30 minutes of walking a few days a week will decrease inflammation, will improve blood flow, and, uh, and again, increase uh, longevity. Oxidative stress, and you say, why in the world is he telling us about this? Uh, this is like rust, you know, it literally is rust, except it's inside of us. And the powerhouses of our cell, which are called mitochondria, they end up generating these things called free radicals. And we have ways to deal with these things, but when you eat lots of meat, when you're under stress, you generate so many that we can't handle them all and they begin to damage our body, you know, sometimes making cells unrecognizable because of the damage and causing autoimmune problems. So again, everything begins to dovetail. Now, again, inflammation, uh, which really is a cornerstone of many of these processes, is not all bad. In fact, it helps us. And again, when we bang our elbow and, and, uh, and it swells, uh, you know, that provides protection and cushioning. It improves blood flow. Uh, white cells go there and take care of the debris and other bad cells that are there. You know, it allows, it allows healing. And, um, and so this is a good thing. But when this is running amok, you know, again, too much of a good thing, um, problems uh, begin. Now, this is a really busy slide. I won't spend too much time on it, but only to say that going down to that bottom line, that optimal environment for cancer growth, it really, it really promotes cancer development, we are beginning to believe. And again, not only with uh, a prostate cancer, but with uh, breast cancer as well. And we're beginning to believe some other cancers. And we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit uh, a little bit more. I also wanted to point out the insulin and insulin resistance. Again, a major driver of inflammation. And again, it begins to cause processes which beget processes, which then turn around and beget those same processes. So it's kind of like a dog chasing its tail in terms of uh, developing more inflammation and more problems. Now, on the good side, again, exercise decreases inflammation. And while animal fat increases it, a plant diet or a much better diet uh, improves these things. Um, this CRP level, uh, this is a marker that we often use in our clinic. Um, it's sometimes hard to figure out you know, what kind of risk people are at, especially women. And, um, and we may check a CRP level. And if they have underlying coronary disease, uh, while some of our standard tests that we use may not show up, they may have an elevated uh, CRP. We see it also in, in diabetes. We see it in um, folks who eat too much white bread, too much animal protein, white rice, uh, high fructose corn syrup. So that essentially, you know, if you eat a Big Mac and a Coke, um, your CRP is going up and it's going up pretty fast too, sometimes within a few hours. We do testing of the inner lining of the blood vessels uh, called the endothelium. And uh, we can see changes within an hour or two after eating a Big Mac and drinking a Coke. 
If you're a millennial, you can handle this really fast. Your, your function is back to normal in a few hours. If you're in your 60s, uh, it may return back to normal the next day. Um, the story of Tor. Now, again, this is just another regulatory uh, protein. And, and I have their bullet train with no break. And again, uh, TOR is just a regulatory protein that uh, promotes growth. And um, it's important for babies. It's stimulated by milk and animal protein. Older adults don't need to, um, we, don't, we don't need to grow. We don't need to proliferate. And in fact, in us, it can cause cancers and benign tumors, and then it promotes growth of their brain really fast uh, so that um, this is an important protein and it gets stimulated by, again, guess what? Bad diet, you know, again, the same thing again. Um, women and stress, um, you know, we point this out just because women are really excellent subjects for stress, especially those in their late 40s and 50s when they're taking care of a parent with dementia. Uh, when they're kind of handling their kids as they're transitioning finally into adulthood. And, um, and they are said to be under maybe more stress than a, a general field marshal. And um, we should also point out that black women under particular stress. And in fact, there's some problems like higher infant mortality rates that we really can't explain by socioeconomic data. And it's probably just, you know, the stress of living in America, plus just a generalized stress of the problems that women kind of handle on a day-to-day -day basis, especially as they get older. Learning how to deal with this stress is, is critical. Uh, women who have dealt, who are dealing with it, and, and when I mean positively dealing with it, well, they more, they're more Teflon. Um, it doesn't affect them as much, and they don't get the inflammation that, and that we often see uh, with generalized stress as, say, someone who doesn't. So our perception of this stress counts, and the way in which we deal with it also counts. Um, our program is, is designed to help people to learn to, uh, to, learn to deal with this. Um, Stress in general elevates catecholamines. Catecholamines are as adrenaline and, and some of the adrenaline uh, cousins. Um, they increase blood pressure. Um, stress increases blood pressure in general. It, it increases vasoconstriction, which is just tightening of the uh, vessels. It also alters uh, endothelial uh, function, which is again, that inner lining that protects us. And it, and it activates inflammatory pathways. It's just like bad food. Um, now, again, traditional medicine has extended life. And again, I'm a traditional doctor and we do traditional things. We give lots of pills and we make people better and we know we are extending life. And if you look at a lot of the data, I mean, heart attacks are decreasing, coronary artery disease is decreasing, uh, blood pressure problems are increasing, but you know, in our clinic, we're getting a better handle on these things, but people are beginning to kind of limp, you know, that last 10 years. And we think that uh, lifestyle programs could make a big difference for many of them. Now, this advanced glycation end products, I threw this in here just because I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and it's age. And it's because these products kind of age us. They have an effect in many parts of our bodies and the major source of these basically sugared proteins are the things that we eat. And if you, if you look at this at the top, look at bagel, 60 of these units. We don't even have to know what it is, but steak has, has, has 3,000. If you multiply that uh, times a really good steak, a nice big one, um, you know, you're talking 30,000 of these units. And again, the more of these units, the, the, the worse the effect. And again, it just shows that it, you know, it does matter. It does matter what we eat. Now, this is a Ruth Chris Porterhouse for two. And I can tell, I mean, it's, it's delicious, you know. And no, Dr. Hatch is not a vegan. He is trying to move in that pathway. Um, but uh, I, I still like my steak and I just wanted to show it. Um, so, bad lifestyle. And again, I guess we're just trying to get across what it does to our, our personal environment. To me, we, uh, well, folks in their 50s, 40s, you know, we're kind of like this truck, you know. 
Uh, we burn meat or it burns diesel. And look at that black smoke going into the air. And compare that to the Tesla, which is a plant eater, you know, and no smoke, pulling the same load, doing the same thing, um, but no bad byproducts going into the body. Uh, no AGE units doing bad things. Uh, no stress hormones going up. Um, good lifestyle. Again, Earth loves Tesla. So again, you know, what we eat matters. I mean, it really does matter more than just the calories, what we are taking in, because probably 95% of everybody with diabetes, you know, it's, it's probably potentially reversible. Uh, we see this reversing in our, in our lifestyle program, and we'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. Now, the anti-inflammatory effects of a vegan diet. I, I put this slide here just to show you that it's comparing a vegan diet, you know, this is just plant-based and not eating any, any cheese or dairy products versus just a good diet, you know, and 32% higher level of this CRP, this inflammation marker. Um, and again, this, this I mean, ADA diet is a good diet. You know, most of us don't do this diet. I don't know if I quite reached that level quite yet, uh, but, I'm, but I'm trying. But again, it, there's a strong association between inflammation and what we eat. And the worse off you are, the better you better get close to that vegan diet. Now, the EPIC study was a study of lifestyle in Europe. They, they have like 500,000 patients and uh, subjects who they are following and, uh, and looking at and looking at a variety of things, including uh, cancer and cardiovascular disease. One of the interesting things they found was that healthy factors, you know, being close, a good diet, kind of like that ADA diet, some exercise, um, no smoking, uh, you know, good social support, and, and then voila, 78% reduction in chronic disease, 93% reduction in diabetes, 80% decrease in the incidence of myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, and 50% stroke risk, and probably, uh, I think, 35-40% cancer uh, risk uh, reduction. And again, that's just, just healthy lifestyles. Again, so many of our problems would, would go away. So again, in summary, bad diet is, is bad. Uh, sustained stress is bad. Um, no exercise, no movement is, is bad. So, so it really makes fixing these things you know, fairly, uh, fairly simple. Um, now, I bring up this, this vaccine for chronic diseases mainly because it kind of struck me as I just had gotten my vaccine uh, for the COVID. And what we're finding with the COVID is that, and I really encourage everybody to do that vaccine, by the way, is, um, um, is now the big problem is how do they disperse it? How do they get it out to the people? Uh, you know, the current administration did a good job of getting this vaccine made, uh, but, uh, but the dispersal part is difficult. And we, and we face the same thing in lifestyle medicine is how do we get it to the people? And again, there are a variety of programs and this Ornish program certainly does not have the market on this, but it is a proven uh, way to disperse this knowledge. And in, in our program, and again, I'll answer more about this when we start answering questions, um, it's, it's, it's a program that really is powerful. Again, not only reversing chronic diseases, but taking care of some immediate problems. One of our first patients had a uh, was having angina, uh, you know, on the treadmill as he was walking, and I remember Dr. Orner saying that, "Hey, in three weeks or so, chest pain begins to go away." And I will tell you, I did not believe him. You know, I, I honest to God, did not believe him. I was like, "If a stent can't take it away, if a bypass can't take it away, if my beta blocker nitrates." Uh, not, you know, eating some plants certainly isn't going to do it. And I can tell you, this dude's chest pain went away in two and a half weeks. And it's because it's, it's through mod moderating diet, uh, through improving social support, through increasing exercise, and um, uh, you begin to get improvement in flow and decrease in vascular um, 
and a decrease in um, vascular placking and a decrease in vasoconstriction. These things really begin to reverse. And not only does bl do blockages begin to reverse, but inflammation begins to reverse. We have had patients whose diabetes literally has gone in two weeks. We're pulling off the medicines. You know, I am not a diabetic doctor. And um, I am not a diabetic doctor. And, uh, but, you know, I'm an internist and I know how to take away the medications and decrease the doses. And it's really fascinating when you're taking away somebody's insulin after two weeks who's been on it uh, for several years. Uh, when they are coming off of all their diabetic medications at the end of the month, um, when their blood pressure problems are going away, uh, when they literally are losing 17, 18 pounds in nine weeks, and when they are almost unrecognizable nine months later. And, and not in terms of their face or necessarily their size, but often in the way they move and in, in, the, uh, in their core strength and um, it's, it's, again, it's, it's a fascinating uh, process. Um, so getting back to this again, reiterating, really good diet is good. Plant-based diet is best. Exercise is good. And the stress reduction is good. And, and the last thing I will say is, again, I was talking with Ornish and I said, why do we got to do all this touchy-feely stuff? why you know we we sat in a group and we did this kumbaya stuff and it was you know where we kind of just talked and um and we also did yoga i had never done yoga and i said why do i have to do this what does this have to really do with anything and what he said was the diet and the exercise will keep things at bay but we didn't begin to see reversal until we did this that these problems are so profound that we have to hit it with everything we have. And that when we initiated these, uh, asp this aspect of the program, um, we began to see reversal. We began to see improvement in blood flow. And he didn't just do it with a questionnaire, he did it with PET scans. And we don't do it with a questionnaire, we do ultrasounds, you know, sometimes before and after and can compare people the year before and after and look at the carotid plaques in their, uh, in their net and, and watch them shrink. You know, we're looking at their exercise times going from two minutes to, uh, um, to, um, to 30 and 40 minutes. We're watching patients um, who want to dance, who could only make it through one dance who now can dance for the entire two hours. So uh, this lifestyle stuff, you know, I, I'm becoming a believer and um, it's good for diabetes. It's good for our general health. And, um, and hopefully uh, more of you will look into it in the near future. Uh, uh, thank you. Um. Coming back to ask questions, Dr. Hatch, fabulous. I want to dance. Actually, I want to be able to run a 50 meter dash <laughs> at my age and I'm about to be 70. And your mom did it, well, then that's another story. So tell me about pre-diabetes and diabetes. That's the first question. What's the difference between pre-diabetes and diabetes? And if well, you get diabetes, once you reverse it, can it come back again? Uh, well, that, uh, that last question is, is, is yes, it can. Now, pre-diabetes is a state that, well, I mean, that it is rampant in the South and the Southeast. It's rampant throughout the United States, but it's particularly increased. And again, it's that state. You know, we don't just go from, from being normal one day to, uh, to having diabetes. There's kind of a series of steps that the body is going through. Um, one is, you know, where, where insulin, our body is producing more insulin to get the job done. And the way we identify this state is um, you can, you look at their HDL, you look at triglycerides, we measure their waist circumference, you know, like if it's a, above 40 inches in a man, 35 inches in a woman, we look at their blood sugar level, you know, it's not diabetic level, but it's running around a hundred or so. And, um, you know, we look at these factors 
and and we call it metabolic syndrome you know this pre-diabetic state and um and and the chances of these folks developing diabetes increases by like 50 percent over several years we pretty much can almost guarantee they are going to get diabetes if they continue going down that same course and identifying these factors, uh, you know, allows us to intervene. Next question is about natural herbs that can be used to help with type two diabetes. And that, they didn't ask about type one diabetes, but would you address that? Will any of these procedures help with type one? Uh, you know, type one, you're kind of stuck because you essentially have, have no insulin. And, um, and so you're going to need insulin. And, and usually what we are recommending again is, is, you know, and I hate to say it, but not so much herbs, but really exercise, you know, us, we Americans, you know, what we want is we want our Ruth's Chris and our cake and health. <laughs> we want it all. And, and, and you can't have it all, you know? And, uh, and, and the simple fact is, is that we have to eat better and exercise, you know? You can do some herbs if you want, but, uh, but, um, but just eating better is, uh, and stressing a little less and moving more really is gonna do the trick. Uh, you don't really need any pumpernickel, you know? There, there's a question about some specific herbs. I just want to mention these to you because mm -hmm. I've not heard of this. Soursop, please. You know, I, I have not heard of these. Uh, you know, I've not heard of that particular one. Um, I saw that in the, the list of pre-questions. Uh, and, um, yeah. and no, I have, not, I have not heard of that. But, you know, there, there are several things that, that people are using. I mean, again, folks love, I mean, they come in, they're on their CoQ10, you know, they're on their garlic. And again, if it does have a medicinal impact, well, I mean, it's, then it's, it's a medicine. It, you know, and again, we have medicines. And if people are interested in taking more pills, you know, um, the industry, you know, whether the, the pharmaceutical industries will provide this. Um, and yeah, I mean, some of these really do have an impact and some of them can decrease cholesterol and it's all well and good. But again, the cholesterol is often high because of what we eat and our problems, I think, center around the fact that um, we are doing what we want, and then we're taking pills to basically mask the effect. And that is a lot of what I do as a cardiologist, you know, because folks can't or won't change what they're doing, uh, we're having to medicate them to get them over the hump. And these medicines, and even a lot of these, um, these, these extracts that people are using, they do have an effect and they do make a difference. Um, but is it the best way? We, we don't think so. What about daily calorie count? Does um, the amount of food you eat make a difference? It, it makes a uh, tremendous difference. Uh, what I can tell you from my own personal experience, you know, during the last year, I had to lose 40 pounds uh, because I was pre-diabetic and was hitting and it was also imploded my, my right ankle. And the doctor, he was very nice to me. He says, you are too big. You know, he, he didn't go the F word, you know, but he just told me I was too big. I needed to lose weight, which I knew, you know, because my ankle had been hurting and I wasn't exercising anymore. And um, and what I have found um, exercising even up to an hour a day is that in order to lose weight, I had to reduce caloric intake. I could burn a thousand calories a day and I could easily eat through that as most people can. And so caloric restriction is clearly important. And sitting down with your dietitian, I mean, they can tell you about what you should be eating. For most of us, say who weigh between 180 and 250, that's gonna be anywhere from, um, uh, from 1,600 to 18, 1,900 calories, you know, if you throw in exercise. If someone is attempting to lose weight uh, who's around 200 pounds, uh, yeah, they probably are looking at, at 1,700 calories a day and, um, and exercising. Have you read the book, Fork Over Knives? Have you seen the documentary, Fork Over Knives? That's a plant-based diet. Does that really, have you read it? 
Have you seen that, it? And do you think it's a good example, a good leader on how to go about changing your diet? You know, I have not seen that. I guess I, I have seen uh, several of the, uh, the professors in their talk who, who uh, have, are strongly advocating the plant-based diet. Um, um, I am, I, you know, my daughter is a uh, vegetarian and I was much less worried after I learned more about this over the last several years. I was much less worried because I was worried about the quote quality of the protein. And what we now know is that uh, pigs and cows simply serve as an intermediary, that they get their protein from the plants and, um, and we could just as easily get our protein from the plants. And again, not everyone. In fact, most of the people who do our program are not going to become vegans. You know, in fact, they won't, most of them won't become vegetarians, but many of them will begin to have plant-based days and will have plant-based lunches and, um, and begin to at least move toward an ADA diet equivalent. Now, I would say 10% of our patients do actually become vegetarian. And yeah, those, those guys, they have the most dramatic effects. They've lost weight. They're not coming back to our cath labs anymore. Uh, they have great exercise tolerance and look like different people. What about places to go to find a shopping list of the things that you can eat or to find a physician who prescribes plant-based diets? Where can they go to find someone like you? You know, I mean, that is a that is a challenge, you know, and that is a challenge. Most of us who are trying to get healthier, um, you know, in our town around here, we are right outside of Little Rock. You know, and this is a pretty big area. This is the metropolitan area for the state, um, you know, other than in northwest Arkansas, where, you know, uh, where Walmart is. And um, um, it is not impossible but, um, but every place has a few items, but no place has a lot of items. And, um, and it, is, it is difficult. Um, with, in terms of physicians, um, there are physicians who are interested in this, but finding them, I, I can tell you, they will be a challenge because they're not very many around here and often they really don't advertise. Um, it's become more difficult because more of the physicians are the same. Um, you know, we are one of two independent cardiology practices in central Arkansas. The other 150 cardiologists work for different hospital systems. And, um, and so you begin to get kind of the same thing again and again. Um, um, we are generally not what people expect. Um, just because we take care of the sick people at the hospital too, you know, and, and I, and I am not a, and again, I'm not a vegan. Um, I don't get angry when people talk about eating, uh, eating um, cows. Uh, but I do understand the importance of, uh, of a of moving toward a plant-based diet. And, um, and so what I, all I can tell you is that, that you can find them, but it will be a challenge. The Ornish diet, we can find you online and we can find out information about the Ornish diet also online. And after this session, session is over and give a, at least a week site. And the Ornish diet that Dr. Hatch has been talking about will be found there as well. What if someone loses their colon how does that contribute to a diabetic condition, not having a colon? Um, you know, the, the big, one of the biggest things about not just having a colon, but, uh, well, we'll, we can talk about the intestines too, but not having a colon, you know, the colon is where, you know, you're reabsorbing water. And so not having a colon is, is, is extremely problematic in terms of just volume control. And uh, and volume and the amount of fluid we uh, take in, you know, is important in terms of uh, uh, managing our diabetes. You know, I think you know one of the more interesting things in you know say in diabetes is um, and in chronic diseases is 
you know, the small intestine and the colon, when you look at the, you know, the entire GI tract, um, you know, it's loaded with microbes um, and they, we call it the microbiome. And this has a tremendous impact on developing diabetes, uh, but developing other problems, perhaps autoimmune problems. And what we now know is again, bad diet equals bad germs. Bad germs make you absorb more calories. Uh, bad germs can work their way into your bloodstream and begin to cause some of these autoimmune problems. And um, a good, a, a set of good germs in your colon is, is really critical. I mean, we actually count on them uh, so that we can live well. And again, uh, how we move, how we eat and what we do and has a tremendous impact long-term on our health. I have another question about a specific condition, pancreatic cancer. How does diabetes affect your body if you had pan pancreatic cancer? Well, you know, the pancreas can, contains, you know, some of the hormones that are needed uh, in order to control diabetes. And, and also it, it provides um, 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 digestive, um, enzymes that break down our food. And so, you know, if somebody has pancreatic cancer, um, um, assuming they survive it, then a lot will have to do with, well, where was the cancer located and, and what's left? Uh, some of the patients end up with, with insufficiency and, and can have diabetes. Uh, they also can have difficulty digesting certain foods. But again, these enzymes are replaceable, you know, and again, the hormones are, are also, um, are also replaceable. I am going to ask a couple more questions before we let go to the questions that have been entered today. But here's a question on neuropathy. Are there medications available that will help with neuropathy? And okay. this person has been taking metformin for over 10 years five pills a day? You know, what, 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 I, what I believe, and I think many others believe, is that the best way to, to tackle uh, neuropathy, and again, this isn't uh, so much uh, for, the, uh, 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 for our friend asking the question, but just for folks who may be at the beginning of their diabetic journey, and, and that the best way to avoid neuropathy, again, is not gonna be any medications or supplements, but it's gonna to be to get rid of the diabetes. Now, there are a host of medications that are now out to help us handle neuropathy. Um, um, gabapentin is one that is being utilized. And again, it just kind of modulates the way these nerves feel, but that nerve damage, because we have to say, what are we saying? We're saying neuropathy, nerve disease. We're saying that these nerves are basically being broken uh, by the diabetes. And again, to, to halt it in its tracks, get rid of the diabetes. Uh, but are there medications? Yes, yeah, that, that can help, yes. Does good blood sugar control halt neuropathy? Eh, you know, kinda, you know, that the data is, you know, is, is not strong. And again, the, the best way to do it is get rid of the diabetes. Um, does, that, but, does that help reverse it as well as stop it what's from getting that? worse? Does, uh, can you reverse, by reversing diabetes, does that also reverse nerve damage? You know, it may not, it may not reverse the nerve damage, you know. Now, have we had patients where you know, the diabetes is gone and, and some of those neuropathic changes do seem to sometimes get better. You know, and I've always wondered, well, you know, is this coincidental or, or, or what, you know? Um, early on, you know, medications will often take care of a good bit of that neuropathic discomfort, you know? Um, but will it all necessarily go away? Not necessarily. And that's why it's so important. If, if you're gonna do it, do it early before these changes uh, begin to um, begin to take hold. This is my last question before Lene Baker goes to the questions that have been entered today. This person had, has a ch child that had VSD repair as an infant. 
although it's repaired, could any complications occur throughout his life? And her other question is, at what age should you have your children tested for cardiomyopathy? Um, well, let's do the last one, because that was easy. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> The, uh, the you know cardiomyopathy is just decreased um, de a decrease in heart function, a decrease in ejection fraction, and in general, you know we don't necessarily screen people for that because most people, you know, will have normal heart function. Now there are sets of people who we will screen. Um, um, amyloidosis, you know, this is an infiltrative problem. Um, we are now, we actually now have a treatment for this where we really didn't have one years ago. And we are now beginning to screen the relatives of, of patients who have this. Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's HCM. You know, again, that is a, a, um, a disease of the heart muscle where we will screen patients um, and their uh, relatives. And especially if their relatives have had certain um, problems like passing out, sudden death. Uh, yeah, we're much more likely uh, to, uh, to screen those folks. But in general, most folks don't need screening. Uh, now, as far as the first question, the VSD, um, usually if, when they repair that VSD, and if that really is the only problem, um, they usually are going to be fine. We have several patients who have um, old repaired BSDs, and they are not having any uh, significant uh, um, issues at present. If that BSD is associated with other problems, well, then yes, they need to then be monitored, uh, you know, by a cardiologist or, or even better, a, uh, a congenital specialist. You know, there are some adult cardiologists who kind of specialize in that. Thank you so much. Now, Lene Baker is going to ask questions. Go ahead, Lene. Thank you, Ms. Page. Thank you so much, Dr. Hatch, for your talk. It was so interesting. I enjoyed it, and I know all of our participants did as well. Oh, um, we're going to start out by asking a couple questions about holistic health. Um, what are the health benefits of taking Irish sea moss, elderberry tea, and curcumin? You know, it, it, the 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 beneficial effects in general are that that they have powerful antioxidant properties. You know, and again, we talked about the powerhouses of the cell and these free radicals that develop. And when you eat too much meat and do all the wrong things under too much stress, you get more of these little, little radical elements. And, um, and, and uh, these, uh, these foods and drinks, you know, contain elements in them, antioxidants that can actually neutralize these things. So they can be, uh, so, so that they can be helpful. Thank you. Another question we received was about some of the screenings that patients that ask their physicians for. What is the normal range for CRP that doctors should test for? Oh, you know, I would have to look because it's actually different because, because um, you know, there's CRP and then there's high sensitivity CRP. Um, anything, you know, with a high sensitivity CRP, anything over two, you know, we, be, we get concerned uh, about. Um, we utilize high sensitivity CRP, say, in cardiac patients. Um, CRP, I mean, again, you have to be careful. I mean, because, you know, you can get a lot of labs drawn. CRP is really a, it's, it's very general, you know. Again, if you come in with an inflamed knee, your CRP is up. If you come in with pneumonia, your CRP is up. If you have coronary disease and a blockage and nothing else, we don't know why, but your CRP is up. So it's, you know, so it's very general, you know, and, um, um, but most docs really, they have a good idea of, of what to do with these and, and who to send you to, you know, if it is elevated. So is there a connection between CRP and colon cancer? And why is colon cancer on the rise? Um, you know, I don't know if there's a strong connection between CRP and colon cancer, other than the fact that, you know, if it is elevated, again, you talk about the chicken or the egg thing, you know, CRP is often elevated in inflammatory states. Colon cancer loves inflammatory states. 
people who get colon cancer often, again, are taking in these, you know, the bad diet and not exercising. And, and so it, it really could be more related to that than say the colon cancer, uh, than say the colon cancer itself. Um, we believe that colon cancer is on the rise because a lot of it has to do with the diets that we are eating. Um, colon cancer, I think, is one of the few screening things that we do, which really can, can have a powerful effect uh, on patients and a population. They, they, you know, if you catch these cancers early, they are fixable. And it's a matter of just going in and, you know, and having your screening uh, colonoscopy. Um, uh, but again, if you want to avoid it, um, you know, we eat better, we move more, you know, we do these things. Lene, do you want to squeeze in one quick question in 30 seconds, Dr. Hatch? And Absolutely. because we then need to turn it over to Joan. Okay, I'll talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. Lene, you want to ask one quick one? Yes, our last question is, um, do you have experience working with patients who are on a keto diet? We do, and we hate keto diets. <laughs> <laughs> That was fast. <laughs> um, you know, it really now, Dr. Ornish hates keto diets. I can tell you that. Uh, the gods of lifestyle medicine hate keto diets. Ash does not hate keto diets. And, and the reason is, is because um, some folks really need to lose weight. And, and it can help them to lose that 30 pounds. But what I tell our patients is, look, you have got to transition to a more healthy diet. Lose your quick little weight. But then we have to have you transition. Thank you, Dr. Hatch. You are fabulous. Now I'm going to turn the session back over to Dr. Joan Packingham. Joan? Yes. Dr. Hatch, what a phenomenal presentation. And, and that was an awesome Q&A session. Um, eating a better diet, moving toward plant-based, don't know if I can get to a plant-based diet, but moving toward plant-based, maybe eating plant-based a couple of days a week. Um, uh, decreasing stress, that's a great one for women, and increasing our exercise. I, I wanna tell the, um, the audience this afternoon, this evening, that um, the diabetes health resources are available on the Women's Health Awareness website. There are a lot of resources uh, that will help you as it relates to diabetes health, nutrition, education, and from our federal and national agencies about diabetes. Immediately following this webinar, evaluations will be sent to each of you via email. Uh, please note that for attending the webinar and completing the evaluation, you will receive educational contact credit hours for your participation. Our November webinar raffle winner. Congratulations to Mrs. Tina Hester, who won the raffle from our November webinar. So clap to Tina Hester. Thank you so much, Tina for attending. We're going to spin her name around for a minute. Um, our next session is on cardiovascular health. We heard some things about cardiovascular health tonight, but we will have additional things on cardiovascular health. You are your own best health heart advocate. Now know the early warning signs of heart disease. We have another cardiologist, Dr. Thacker, uh, who will talk about and discuss cardiovascular health um, on February the 11th, 2021. Again, thank you for your continued support and attendance of Women's Health Awareness, and especially this virtual series. Uh, we greatly appreciate you attending, and we hope that you have learned something this evening that will help you on your healthy journey. Thank you and good night.